Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. This podcast is sponsored by Collins, high quality student books, teacher guides and unbeatable value revision for GCSE and A-level sociology. If you'd like to see what they've got on offer, then please do visit collins.co.uk and search for sociology. The Sociology Show podcast is also brought to you in association with tutor to you Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. So you can see what they've got on offer please do go to tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology and there you can pick up revision guides, you can get flashcards, you can get revision videos and everything else you need for your A-level or GCSE sociology studies. And so my guest for this episode was Dr. Ben Milbon. So without further ado, let's go over to the interview. Hi, thank you very much for coming on the sociology show. Uh, Do you want to start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, um, thanks for inviting me on, uh, Matthew. My name's uh, Dr. Ben Milbourne. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist and I'm a senior lecturer in the Curtin School of Allied Health at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia. Thanks, Ben. So I was just trying to work out a time difference. How far ahead are you? We're, (laughs) We're actually eight hours. Uh, ahead of you guys so it's um it's i think what 2 40 in the afternoon in the uk so it's 9 40 p.m here yeah yeah it's great and miserable here so go on make me jealous what's it like <laughs> uh well we I, I dare i say it, we're sort of coming into sort of autumn but uh western australia um we do kind of uh, get a lot of hot weather um autumn is kind of looking like 21 degrees at the moment at, at the sort of uh, 9 40 at night yeah. um but um as as you might know you know we, we um on the eastern states around uh, uh queensland we've had a lot of uh, flooding um in south australia you know we've we've had uh, bushfires so it, yeah it, the, <laughs> that not to jump on the bandwagon of cli- climate change but certainly uh, we're seeing a lot of lot of changes uh, around our climate at the moment yeah understandable understandable now Ben we're, we're, since we've been in touch trying to sort out our little meeting we realize that our paths not just cross but pretty clashed actually and um, we worked out <laughs> both did sociology both at the same university and not only that but at the same time as well I know it's <laughs> I, I and, I, and I suppose just uh, Matthew it's been so wonderful listening to uh, your podcast and um, I, I don't even know how I, how I kind of found it on the Apple podcast service and it was just yeah it's, it's been so great to listen to all the different guests and uh, and as you're quite right we were there uh, together um, in Portsmouth in the 90s and uh I, wow, what what a, an experience! It was such a an eye opener that course, and and to have the the scope and opportunity to study different aspects of, of sociology. And um, I think in one of our conversations, we were talking about Keith Tester, and um, I, I, for me, the, the journey really does start with Keith. And um, you know, I think Sandy's uh, first year, first semester lecture, and and him trying to explain. Uh, I always remember this. Um, uh, adiaphorization and and how that kind of influences you know, people and um yeah wow it, it's you're taking me right back there Matthew. yeah keith tester is a, a standout lecturer for me by a long way uh, firstly he was a fellow brighton fan which meant i got on with him quite well but um, you know to be able to stand at the front of the lecture theater and talk for one hour with no notes and keep every single person engaged what what a kind of not just an academic but what a performer Oh, the, the, the guy was just just uh, he 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 was really down to earth, um, but um, he was you know he was just 
dare I say, you know, he was uh, erudite. He, he, he could talk and, and, and the depth he could go into around topics like moral culture. Um, obviously, you know, he, he was, had a real strong interest in Zygmunt Bauman's work and um, really understood his work and could kind of, you know, unpack it and, and explain it in a way that people could relate to it. Yeah, and uh, he did a one-hour lecture on Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, just breaking it down and explaining it, and it's, it still lives long in the memory. Um, sadly, passed away a, a few years ago, so rest in peace, uh, Keith. Yeah, yeah Fantastic. I was really sad to read that. No, great great guy, great guy. Yeah, and I, I think it, it shows a lot that just how inspirational a teacher or a lecturer can be. Uh, you know, we're talking 25 years plus later, and it, it still sat firmly in our memories. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the way he was able, I, I remember this, I think, in, in one of the lectures, him talking about, um, and, and very relevant to, you know, what we're seeing today, um, what's happening in Ukraine. So what are you going to do about it? And and talking about moral indifference and, and talking about how, yeah, easy um, people can kind of be disconnected. And I think he he was very attuned to almost kind of seeing what was kind of coming coming next. And and I think that's a that's something about sociology. Um, it gives us the tools to 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 look uh, and analyze to to see how things kind of might sort of develop and shape. Yeah. And you're right, his, his kind of key philosophy is not, not just to learn about it, but to try and change it. I think if it was up to Keith, he would have changed the world. <laughs> you know, it was yeah, an inspiration. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. That's a lovely introduction. So let, let's get stuck into a little bit more about yourself. So occupational therapy, one of those terms that people have heard. Should we break it down to the basics? What, what actually is occupational therapy? <laughs> That's the sixty-four million dollar question, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can give you the theoretical answer. I can, I can try and do what Keith used to do and give you the layman answer. So, <sighs> occupational therapists—they're um, really interested in what is the art and, like, the science of enabling participation in everyday uh, activities or everyday lives. Um, so, 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 what do I mean by that? Well. Occupational therapy certainly is about working with people who might be experiencing uh, an illness, an injury, a disability, an impairment, and working with them to perhaps look at how they're doing it, so the way they might be performing that everyday uh, occupation. That could be something around self-care. So, for example, being able to wash yourself, being able to dress yourself. It might be around participation. And we know that, you know, participation in, in social activities, it, it fosters a sense of well-being. It fosters a sense of, of, um, of identity. It fosters a sense of, of uh, being, being kind of uh, yeah, connected with other people. Um, so engaging in, in leisure uh, occupations, we know they're, they're good for us. But it also could be around productivity and, and look, you know, trying to avoid the, the real capitalist definition of productivity. We, we do think about productivity as, as just work, but what about volunteering? Uh, what about for people who are in caring roles, looking over after other people, how that might be defined around productivity? So occupational therapists will work with the person, with the strengths and perhaps the identified needs. So I don't like to use the word deficits, but um, the things that perhaps they're having some difficulty with. And often we will look at where they're doing that. So the environment for an occupational therapist is really, really important. Um, and how we look at the environment. So the social environment, obviously, who's in that social environment? And it could be going from the uh, the micro, you know, uh, family members, friends, to 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 the to the macro. So the people that we connect with through, say, social media, say, through uh, organisations, through clubs, through the people that we work with. Um, but not just the social environment, there might be uh, aspects such as the physical environment. So perhaps what are the difficulties? So let's say you're working with somebody who perhaps is using a wheelchair and the physical environment acts as a barrier for that person to be able to get to work. As an occupational therapist, you're using these skills of art and science to understand what are perhaps the, the enablers or barriers for that person 
participate in or not participate in, in that valued occupation. I hope that <laughs> you've got the technical and you've got the lay there, Matthew. So I hope that's not, not uh, too uh, specific. No, no, that's great. And I was just thinking, so sort of what, what does the day in the life of an occupational therapist look like? I, I mean, I imagine it's different depending on who you're working with, but, but what do you actually do day to day, if you like? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And, and, um, and again, I think in our conversation, we, we, our paths have, have definitely crossed in places where we've lived as well. So I trained as, a, as an occupational therapist um, at University of Brighton um, after I did my sociology degree. So I come in as a graduate entry um, master's. Uh, we, call, we call them in Australia graduate entry master's, but I think it's something else in the UK. Um, and I did uh, a two-year um, uh, uh, graduate um what do we call it? postgraduate diploma of occupational therapy and a master's degree at the same time and and after i finished my training um i went and worked in a variety of different settings so um i, I worked for social services and the day in the life uh, working in social services you might be going out to people's homes and you might be carrying out an assessment and and I'm always a bit wary about using this word assessment because assessment always kind of says you know is there a right answer is a wrong answer but in the mind of an occupational therapist assessment is about information gathering because from that information gathering, you are thinking around them, okay, what are the enablers? What are perhaps stopping that person being able to get upstairs to use their bathroom? And how is perhaps their impairment impacting on that ability? So you'd go out to somebody's home, you would get to know them because it's, you know, it's no good just sort of knocking on the door, right, I'm coming in, I'm doing an assessment. You've got to build a relationship and what, what we mean around therapeutic relationships. So like we're kind of doing at the moment, you know, kind of getting to know one another, having a, a conversation which is, is leading somewhere. And in this case, it's collecting that information to help you understand perhaps what, what are the strengths and needs of that person. From that, you would perhaps make some uh, recommendations and in that role in social services yeah, we'd be we might provide some equipment so let's let's perhaps um, think about somebody who maybe has had a, a hip replacement and they're having some difficulty getting on and off their toilet you might think about if by looking well when they're getting on off the toilet perhaps it's taking a lot of energy or strength for them to get up well what can you do around changing that environment you might provide a raised toilet seat or you might provide uh, a frame around the toilet which again is changing that environment to enable that person to be not only safe but independent as well so that might be just an example in say social services in a mental health setting and i worked in mental health in in the uk uh, and worked alongside people who experienced uh, mental health uh, needs and, and, and difficulties it really would depend. Again, you might be going out to people's homes. Um, you might be thinking around perhaps where they uh, have been experiencing some difficulty around their anxiety and going out and doing things like shopping and the, the feelings, uh, the emotions associated uh, with that anxiety might be stopping that person going out and doing that shopping. As the occupational therapist, you'd work with that person to identify perhaps some triggers. Um, and we, we often frame it, and some of your listeners might have heard of cognitive behavioural therapy. So we would use uh, aspects of cognitive behavioural therapy to work with that person to identify potential triggers and look at strategies around practising. And we, we, in occupational therapy, we often use uh, aspects called graded exposure. So we, we don't take the person down to the, um, you know, to Sainsbury's or, or, or Tesco's when it's really busy on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. You might think about going at a quieter time. So you build that person's confidence and awareness around what's happening in that environment. What are that person's strengths? Um, I, I like to think, particularly in the mental health aspect, you know, we work really closely with psychologists and psychologists, you know, talk a lot around strategies, particularly around cognitive behavioural therapy. But I always think occupational therapists, we, we are the people that are actually um, doing that with that person. You know, we're, we're out in that that shopping uh, centre. We're, we're, we're getting on that public transport. Um, 
when I used to work in inpatient mental health settings, um, we were using um, things like boxing or we were using mountain biking uh, as a way of engaging people in their recovery. And, and, and in mental health contexts in particular, uh, in the UK, uh, Australia, the US, uh, the recovery framework is, is a really big, uh, big, I suppose, paradigm uh, shift in terms of how we understand and how we approach mental health and supporting people uh, with their mental health needs yeah and i know one of the areas that you focus on in particular is is uh, autism and adolescent autistic children in particular do you want to tell us a little bit more about the research yeah yeah well um so I, I i did my phd after um moving to australia and so i was working clinically in a mental health setting and so my phd actually looked um at um, people who used specifically um, assertive outreach services. And yeah, it was a really fantastic experience. Um, I, I got to use, used a lot of qualitative um, methodology. Um, and then I, I finished my PhD. And at the time, um, it, it was really hard to kind of connect with other people, particularly researching in that area of mental health. And in our university, I, I was really fortunate to, to be, I suppose, taken under the wing of our our group who are the Curtin Autism Research Group and they are such a, a wonderful group. Um, they have a, and they have a lot of outreach um, research uh, programs which uh, specifically uh, are about supporting uh, autistic individuals in the community and one program uh, I think I mentioned to you was around working alongside uh, autistic uh, adolescents and we, we often uh, hear particularly uh, um, in, uh, around the autism community, we, we, there's a lot of discussion around the term neurodiversity. And it's, again, like what I was saying around the recovery framework, it's, it's a paradigm shift in how we think about autism and how we think about um, supporting uh, autistic individuals. Um, so, so what I mean by that is rather than focusing on what the person can't do, it's about tapping into the strengths, the interests, the passions of the person and and i'm not going to make any kind of wide sweeping statement here but certainly in our community we've had a lot of interest of people who are autistic who have a, a strong passion around computer coding around um around technology around stem and our, our, our group basically built this community program where uh, autistic adolescents come along on a Saturday morning. Um, they're able to connect with other autistic individuals of their own age. Um, they're able to have some fun and also they're able to develop that strength, that passion as a pathway into uh, further training and that could be uh, going into workplace um, and, and work experience going on to further education and in some cases some of our, our, our members have actually gone on and got jobs from that that's interesting could I, I ask you something about that Ben I'm, I'm really interested in those terms you, you mentioned uh, neurodiverse and neurotypical we hear as well um, I always find that really difficult is, is there such thing as a typical brain and isn't everyone diverse do you know what I mean am I overcomplicating that or simplifying that I'm not sure yeah <laughs> I, I think I think that's that's a really good point and certainly um there's a lot more there's been a lot more research in the last um 30 years around what what particularly what we understand around autism and, and neurodiversity and and neurodiversity I, I i think that it is about seeing seeing that people are different and that our brains are different and i think it, it is this shift and and there's been a change, particularly moving from this medical model of diagnosis of, of a disorder rather than actually celebrating that difference. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's really been changed. There's, there's a wonderful, um, t uh, TED talk by a, a collaborator of ours called Jack Den Houting and it's, it's on YouTube, TED talk. And I would really encourage, uh, your listeners to have a look at that. And Jack is, is somebody who, uh, is autistic and, and, and neurodiverse. And I think she could probably articulate it better than up than I am I, I'm, I'm not autistic I'm actually a parent of an autistic child and so again I think that drives my own kind of passion around uh, how we perhaps look at it and how we focus on strengths rather than perhaps deficit 
Yeah, agreed, agreed. Because I, I was even thinking, you know, to, two people that fall into neurotypical could be very, very different. It doesn't mean that, you know, two, two people falling into, um, you know, clusters autism, that, that's such a huge spectrum as well, isn't it? Well, I, I, think, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Matthew. It, the, the idea that it is a spectrum and that the, the presentation of what that looks like is going to be different. So, um, I, I mean, you know, if I use the example of my son, how my son presents with perhaps some of his, um, um, I, I don't want to say behaviours, I, I would say just, just some of the things that make him who he, who he is it's quite different perhaps to some of the other kids uh, in his class or school who may be autistic and present with other things. A, a good example perhaps might be when we go to the beach and perhaps when my son you know, gets a little bit stressed, he will often sensory uh, seek and he'll put his hands in the sand and, and that kind of you know playing with the sand and, 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 ha- and touching it gives him that ability to, to self-regulate or, or, or emotionally regulate. And there's a lot of work and, and our, our group are actually currently involved in that at the moment around looking at how emotional regulation um, is, is, is kind of understood um, and, and in particular, um, one of our, our collaborators uh, who um, is also autistic and, and a big part of our research, we, we, we really try and work alongside, we, we use a, a methodology called co-production. Um, uh, Dr. Wen Lawson, um, who's, who's from the UK and is based in Australia now and wrote, wrote quite a few uh, books around autism and and uh, gender identity as well. Um, we're, we're, when and, and and other people, they're really interested in looking at mental health from the perspective of an autistic individual, rather than mental health as as a kind of broad umbrella which which reaches out to everybody. So, well, what does that mean? Well, perhaps somebody who, who is autistic and and is experiencing significant mental health need, they, they might be turning up at accident and emergency. They might um, perhaps need that support. But other people who, who the clinicians are trying to support are, are using perhaps a, a, a one lens where really it's kind of saying there might be different lenses of, of understanding and supporting uh, that person. Um, a, a really uh, interesting um, concept, particularly uh, um, which ties in, I think, to mental health is around autistic burnout and, and, and masking or camouflaging. So, so the amount of emotional uh, and perhaps physical energy that goes in to um, perhaps camouflaging into a, a, a typical environment that, that somebody may, um, somebody who's autistic may, may have to use, that may result in, in burnout, which, which then negatively impacts that person's mental health. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. You just mentioned co-production. Um, what, do you just want to say a little bit more? What is co-production and how is it used in yeah. research? Yeah, so so that's something um, our group um, have really um, took to our heart, and and our our, um, our actual kind of uh, on our website it is really it comes from uh, the US, but it was adopted in the UK under the social model of disability um, uh, framework. Nothing about us without us. So if you're going to do research with the people you're trying to study, you should be inviting them from the very start. And it shouldn't be tokenistic. It should be, it should be that you're not just having people to advise, but you're paying them and you're paying them a, a, a competitive rate, um, that you'll have involving that, those people with those, that lived experience from the very start and they are guiding and shaping that intervention, um, with, with, with whatever what outcome you get. So it may be that you're doing that research and, um, you know, the result you get, get or the feedback you get might not be what you want to hear. But if you're, if you're doing true co, co-produced research, then, you know, you're doing it from start so uh dr wen lawson who i mentioned um we uh, were involved in a project 
in Australia. So in Australia, we have something called the um, Australian uh, Collaborative Research Centre, and we have one specifically f- uh, for which looks at autism. And um, we had a grant from, from them. And when, uh, when the call out specifically said that you have to have uh, somebody with lived experience in your team and it's not tokenistic and, you know, you're involving them. So we, we, we had Wen on board from the very start for this photo voice project where, and the, and the project actually looked at quality of life for uh, autistic adults in Australia. And um, what we did was um, we set the study up where we interviewed um, adults all over Australia about what they determined was quality of life. Um, but then the next stage of that was we, we uh, were able to get them to take pictures. And again, this comes back to that, that um, neurodiverse perspective that autistic individuals uh, perhaps using the, their understanding of the world to, um, to, to to tell a different story. So, um, and I'm very happy again to share this with your listeners. We, we actually had a, a online art gallery um, of all the pictures that the participants um, uh, took off. And, and like, again, themes which kind of uh, come out of that photo voice um, exhibition was around belonging, was around relationships. Um, it, 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 there was a photo Focus on support needs, and in, in Australia, it, the, the the way um, disability services um, are set up has has been um, quite quite. There's been a significant change. We have something called the National Disability Insurance Scheme over here. So, so the idea of somebody having funding to get a support worker to support their participation in that valued activity or, or occupation, which they're taking a picture of, say, well, by me uh, attending this activity. Um, this really adds to my quality of life. And I'm going I'm to use a little bit of a cliche, Ben, but uh, from everything you've described, the work you're involved in, o- occupational therapy and the projects, um, challenging but rewarding. Is that is that fair? Um, I, I, <laughs> I think kind of the world we're in at the moment, everything is probably a little bit challenging and rewarding. Um, yeah, I, I think... To me, the, the driver is is about making difference in our community, and um, and also that we are supporting individuals to have their voice and, and to make sure that the research we're doing is the research that our, our community wants to do. I think working, uh, I, I, I'm, I'd like to say I'm no longer on the on the tools as 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 in I'm not a clinical occupational therapist anymore. I, I teach occupational therapy. Um, I love my teaching. Um, I teach in the mental health unit. And I also uh, teach um, in the disability unit. And um, I, I think um, going back to our conversation, I, I remember uh, there, there was a gentleman when we were at Portsmouth. I, I was trying to remember his name. I think it might have been Martin Giddy, and I did his disability unit. And again, that was a that was a, just a, a step into a brave new world, learning about things such as the social model of disability. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I suppose trying to answer your question, it's, it's the, um, the Zygmunt Bauman comparison. It, you've got to be a pessimistic optimist so you know you know you have to you have to kind of understand what the needs are to make kind of change yeah i, d- I just wondered but my, one of my points behind the, the word challenging was is is there an ongoing issue with with funding you know to to keep these projects going to push them further is, is that an oh, ongoing I- issue yeah, yeah, I think I think anybody who works in research, it's it's funding is always an ongoing issue. And um, you know, for um, for for every uh, six projects that you put up, you might get one. Um, so it's it is very competitive, um, and that's why I think you know for, for your listeners, perhaps who are going looking to think about a research career, it's it's so important to to join into research groups to get good mentorship um, to you, you know your phd like, like any kind of professional training it, it's it's your it really is just passing your driving test it's it's not until you get your driving test that you really start to learn to drive um so so again i think it's so important that as, as an early career academic you, you get good mentorship 
I, I, funny enough, I was doing a talk for some academics uh, earlier this week, and um, and again early career, and and I was sort of saying to them, don't, don't be afraid to go and knock on people's doors in in the building. And yeah, you know, I was I was really fortunate after I did my PhD. Not only did I get involved with the autism research, but I was involved with um, something in in um, Western Australia called the Mental Health Law Centre, and and. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a lot of money. Um, the grant we actually the, the organisation paid for us to do the research, but really that, that came about from just phoning the organisation up. I am Ben. I work for the university. I'm really interested in mental health and recovery. Um, you know, can, can I come and have a coffee with you? Um, how can I help you? And and I, I, you often find if that word "how can I help you" that really does open doors. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you about one other thing, Ben? Because you also talked uh, absolutely about, you talked about your work at the university. I know you were involved in a, a mental health program there. T- uh, talk to me. Is that what it's called? That's right. Yeah, and that that's been um, a really wonderful and timely program. Um, again, uh, from working in our research group, we do a lot of work with um, researchers in Sweden and. Um, one of the uh, professors in Sweden, uh, Professor Sven Bolte, he's involved in a lot of work around autism and the international classification of functioning. And, and I, I'm, I'm mindful, uh, Matthew, because this is a sociology podcast, and I'm thinking, what are your listeners going This guy's talking about occupation. How does this relate to sociology? But if you look at some of these frameworks, th- there's a real living sociology in it. And I, I can't emphasise the, the importance of the environment and how that, that shapes understanding about disability but how that acts perhaps as barriers as well and um yeah so so we we, we were introduced to some uh, colleagues of Sven's in germany uh who are part of the german national suicide uh, prevention program and they had this really great program that they'd been working on in germany uh, called talk to me which where they were using um with um, kids and gps and um, social care staff and um they were clinicians and uh, they said uh, uh um, to my colleagues Sonia and Ben, we 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 we, we really uh, we, we love what we do, but we're not researchers. Can you help us evaluate it? Okay, well, no, we'd be happy to do that. So what we did, we brought the program back, and it's a suicide prevention program um, which uh, takes a, a strengths based approach, so really aligns to some of the work I was talking about before. And um, we adapted it to an international context. And um, again, very important, we had that co-production aspect. So we actually had consumers with lived experience consult on the the content, in particular, things like the language. And and they sort of said to us, look, yeah, this is great, but this is really academic and your audience are just going to get lost. So again, having that lived experience is so important. It it shapes and and, and changes the content. So other people are going to be able to use it. So we we adapted that, and it's about six modules long. It's in an online platform called edX. It's actually uh, free. It's available. Um, and we released that in March uh, 2020, just as COVID hit. Yeah. And um, I think, look, you know, very timely. Um, it, we got picked up around the world. And to date, we've had about 50,000 people enroll in the program. Um, and, and again, that's I, I just think that's incredible that it's helping people and and as i suppose as 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 one participant um said to me who who we actually they agreed to make some some promo videos for for the program they said look this program is so great because as a student i don't want to have to do the walk of shame to counseling i want to be able to take my learning and, and and understand about mental health in my own time and context and then if i need that extra support I'll go and do that. But um, I I feel that certainly this notion of of, um, having lived experience and, and one other thing we did, which was quite different, we we paid, um, we, we actually had a person with lived experience consult us on some scripts for some video case studies. And the video case studies, we employed actors to um, to kind of have a running narrative throughout the different uh, modules. So for what one of the, the uh, um, and I don't like that word case study, but um, <laughs> the, the person, um, they very much, it's set up, they've moved from home to university, they're really struggling uh, with their studying, and and somebody actually notices that they're, um, they're having difficulty. And, and it follows that 
person as they're learning these skills and applying it with the person who's, who's having that difficulty. It's an obvious thing to say, but the awareness of mental health, particularly over the last couple of years, like you said, since March 2020, has become so noticeable. I had a student this week, a teach A-level sociology, um, who was off and uh, messaged to say, are you okay? Are you sick? Are you not well? And they said, no, I just needed a mental health day. And it's the yeah. first time that I've really seen someone be that open and that direct. And as soon as I read it, I, that's absolutely fine. I, I knew what they meant, you know, um, but that kind of really opened a bit of a door. Like, I've not seen someone say that before. Normally this person makes an excuse and says, you know, they, they've been sick or they're, you know, they're, 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 whatever it might be, they've got a cold or whatever, but to be open and explicit and say, no, I needed that mental health day. I, I, yeah. I hope we are making progress. I think that's what I'm trying I, to say. <laughs> I think we are, Matthew, and, and I think that what, what I think is wonderful about um, the students that I meet is the change in society that um, young people now have a lot of more language around talking about mental health. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. I think where perhaps our program uh, is, is of use to people is you've got the language, but then what next? And, and in Australia, we have something um, called Are You OK Day uh, in September. And, um, and and it's great and it, and it raises that awareness. But I, I've always kind of thought, OK, so what if then you ask somebody, are you OK? Well, no, I'm not OK what do you do next and and the program we sort of set up the whole notion of talk to me is when somebody's sort of saying no, i'm not okay it's not well you need to go and see the gp you need to go and do this it's actually using some of those those um soft skills those listening skills to be able to support that person and and just know that they know you're listening which it sounds like you exactly did for your student there which is again fantastic yeah i, d- I just wonder if that's that's something that we might see more of in the future that you don't you don't have to have this kind of reason or excuse or explanation if someone's off work or they're not in school they're not in college yeah i i absolutely matthew i i, I think that the more we we uh we we have conversations and we I, I'm, it's not necessarily about I'm, I'm not keen to kind of go sh- around down that line of strategies to cure. It's about strategies to support people. Um, you know, at the moment in um, Perth, Western Australia, uh, Omicron is, uh, you know, it, it's kind of on the rise here. And, um, you know, I, I was saying to my students this week, look, if perhaps you have to isolate, you know, just shoot me an email. We can try and work out a way to be able to support you. Um, and but if I don't know what's going on, I, I can't do that. So, so again, it's I think it's I don't want to get sociological about this, maybe, but it's the old uh, Jurgen Habermas and, and talking about you know discourse ethics. It's it's about setting up that dialogue and relationship to be able to people to feel comfortable and, and to build trust and and feel that they can have those conversations. Yeah, uh, just, to, just to counter that, the other side of the coin, I actually had COVID last week, um, you know, and t- t- towards the end of the week, I was feeling a little bit better. And kind of the attitude was, we well, can go back to work, just put a mask on, open the windows, get back on with it. Um, and I thought, well, no, I'm, I'm not well. I'm sick. Yeah. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not on my deathbed, but I, I wasn't feeling great and I was sick and I wasn't mentally ready. And I, uh, there was still kind of a pressure to get get back to work and get on with it and I took the decision no I'm not I'm not well and phys- physically and mentally I'm not in the right state to get back to work and I think we need more more empathy around those sort of situations absolutely yeah I, and I, I hear what, you, what you're saying and certainly um, the, I think it's really easy to get into the mindset of you know we must cut, keep going on we must and, and just kind of stopping and sort of saying well you know this is where i am and this is what i can do and and, and i know my my kind of thresholds around that I, I you know if we want to kind of take a sort of societal perspective we we we, we are encouraged to do more and more and more and fit fit so much in there's there's um yeah what's that expression is it a fear of missing out um i think that really kind of does play a big part as well in in today's society yeah i agree i agree Thank you so much for today, Ben. It's really, really interesting stuff. Um, I, I always give people the opportunity to give out some details. If, if people want to find out more about your work or add you on Twitter, are you happy to give some details out, Ben? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I'm not on Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a bit naughty. I probably should be, but uh, I just think there's probably one more thing for me to do. So, um, so but um, if they want to get in contact, they can email me. So it's uh, ben.milbourne, uh, that's M I L B O U R N, uh, at Curtin, that's uh, C U R T I N, um, dot uh, E D U dot a u um and if you want to have a look at our, our work it's um if you go to the curtain or google the curtain autism research group um as, and when i look it up it's the first hit you'll see us on there and there's a little bit about our team and about our research and um yeah we we um we, we do um travel um we, we again mentioned we do quite a lot of work in sweden my colleague sonia's um been uh she's had some contact with autistica who are based in the united kingdom and i i, I caught up with them a few years ago prior to covid um but yeah we're always really interested to connect with people um you know if people are interested in in further study um likewise um if they're interested in getting involved in research or even i think just making that first step because um i I certainly i don't know if you remember matthew but phd was was not the first thing on my mind when i was doing my undergraduate degree and if you'd said to me you you know um in (laughs) what uh 20 years time uh, you know i'd done a phd and would be doing research I, I just wouldn't have believed it so I think it's really really important that um, we are kind of supporting people to find pathways and uh, pathways into academia and research because um, you, you know like, like my colleague says um, I, I don't know if I can keep doing this the rest of my life and uh, you know you, you want to sort of bring people and, and carry on the good stuff you know yeah, definitely definitely well Ben, it's the afternoon. I've got to go back and teach some more lessons. And I think it's probably time for you to go to bed your end, isn't it? It is, yeah. No, it's, it is. Uh, my son will be up about six o'clock. So, uh, no, it's, uh, it is time. So, no, it's been really wonderful, Matthew. And thank you so much for having me on the show. And, I, I again, I, I, I think for myself and a lot of your listeners, really, I think it's a great show. So, so, well done. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for taking me back down memory lane, Portsmouth in the 90s. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Play up Pompey, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much again, Ben. Take care. No worries. Thank you. I know. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.